Good afternoon, scholars of Earth and environmental science. Today we'll be discussing the dynamics of human population. Dynamics means change. The size of populations, the number of individuals, clearly change over time. Populations increase when more organisms are born and decrease when they die. New organisms can also move in and out of an area, changing the population depending on how you account for it. Life has an interesting characteristic in that it can reproduce exponentially. In asexually reproducing species, like bacteria, they split apart so that one can make two, two can make four, four can make eight, and so on, doubling with every generation. Even sexually reproducing organisms follow similar patterns. Only in very rare cases can populations continue to grow exponentially. Factors limit the extent to which a population can grow. For example, the amount of sunlight, water, and minerals. In addition, for some organisms, as their population density increases, they are more susceptible to disease. These factors define the carrying capacity of an ecosystem, the maximum population that the ecosystem can support indefinitely. However, in the short term, the population of organisms can increase above this level, but it won't remain there for long. Eventually, the population will run out of resources and begin to decline. At this point, the population could collapse completely or fluctuate around the carrying capacity. Competition for these limited resources between or within species could decrease this carrying capacity further. Here is a graph of the world human population over time. It wasn't until around 1800 that the population reached a billion. On the right side, you can see the dates when the population reached the next billion. So, with the concept of carrying capacity in mind, you might think a natural conclusion to this would be an upcoming crash in the human population. This is what Thomas Malthus thought. He was the man depicted on the first slide. The population would overshoot its ability to produce food. Mass starvation would then ensue, leading to miserable living conditions. Was Malthus right? Not really. The rise of industrial capitalism in the early 1800s changed the ballgame entirely. But then we have to ask the questions. How did the human population skyrocket to such an extent? And how will our population change in the future? Let's examine the factors which influence our population growth and carrying capacity. The demographic transition model helps us to conceptualize these. This model assumes that industrial development causes economic and social changes which affect population growth rates, and it was based off of the conditions particular to the United Kingdom, so it may not be accurate for every single country. In stage one, a society is in pre-industrial condition. Both birth and death rates are high. Many people die due to starvation and the prevalence of disease. So as a response, birth rates are also high, since many children die early in life and children are a good source of farm labor. Malthus was working within this framework of a society. But during stage two, death rates begin to decrease with better hygiene, nutrition, and education. Whether these were caused by or responses to the development of industrial capitalism is complicated and depends on the factor. For example, while the mechanization of agriculture increased food yields, better sanitation practices emerged due to the pollution caused by industrialization. Yet, while death rates decrease, birth rates are still high during stage two, which causes the population to grow at an incredibly high rate, potentially doubling every 30 years. In stage three, birth rates begin to fall due to a number of factors. Access to contraception, increase in wages, urbanization, a reduction in subsistence agriculture, an increase in the status and education of women, a reduction in the value of children's work, 
an increase in the parental investment in the education of children, etc. All of these factors could influence a country's birth rate at different times, but the consequence of this is that the population growth begins to level off. During stage four, birth and death rates are both low, so populations can stagnate, decrease, or increase slightly. A lot of countries are currently in stage four, but many have yet to reach there. Reality is complicated, and this model is a generalization. The trend for particular countries depend upon their historical circumstances. For example, European countries colonized Africa in the mid to late 1800s, and colonial regimes implemented policies of forced labor, which induced disease, malnutrition, and stress, which decreased death rates. For example, in the case of Madagascar, colonized by the French, they experienced little population growth during the colonial occupation, despite their increased agricultural yields. In addition, the United States does not follow the demographic transition model trend, because birth rates there declined well before death rates. Yet, the United States still experienced exponential growth. Their death rates were comparatively lower than those in Europe largely because Western colonization in the United States lessened the constraints of food production as there was more land available, although it was taken from the Native Americans, often by force. So what are the consequences of these trends? In 1968, the population growth reached a maximum, so our numbers are still increasing, but at a gradually slower rate. As such, the UN anticipates that our population will level off at about 11 billion humans around 2100, although this prediction depends on the birth and death rates in the future. Regardless, the populations of Europe, North, and South America will largely stagnate, while those in Asia and Africa will continue to increase for some time before beginning to level off. Countries in Africa and Asia just recently started going through the, tra- the demographic transition for many reasons, but a particular one is that colonialism interfered with their ability to industrialize at the same rate as Europe and North America. Humans have shown their ability to disregard many of the factors which previously limited their population, but is this necessarily a good thing? Many argue that this explosion in the human population is responsible for poverty, overcrowding, environmental degradation, pollution, and mass extinction. There's an alluring logic to this line of thinking. For example, more people means they need more space for houses, so they develop more land, which destroys local habitats. Or more people means fewer resources and jobs to go around, so there will be more and more poverty. The end point of the overpopulation viewpoint argues for population control through preventing pregnancies. These solutions are ethically dicey and potentially ineffective at addressing the problems at hand. These methods subordinate women's bodies and reproductive rights toward the ends of sustainability. When using the ends to justify the means, great atrocities can be committed, particularly on vulnerable or minority populations. For example, in India, during the 1970s and 1980s, their states embraced policies which withheld food, water, and medical care from people unless they became sterilized, and students could be expelled from school if their parents weren't weren't sterilized. Around the world, millions of people in the global south have had their reproductive rights put into jeopardy for the sake of stemming population growth. However, it's important to note that the richest 10% of the world emit 175 times more carbon than the bottom 10% in the world. Passing the blame for the ills of the world onto poor, developing countries is unfair and doesn't address the root environmental problems. Sustainable economic practices, environmental conservation, and investment in clean energy and infrastructure would be much more effective at combating climate change, mass extinction, and economic inequality. 
Human population dynamics is a complicated and controversial issue. While when creating public policy, it's important to work within an ethical framework of care for both people and the environment. That's all I have for today about human population. Have a good day.